Okay, awesome. So yeah, uh, hey everyone. First off, uh, thank you so much for joining um, joining us uh, for the session today. I know this session was a bit of um, short notice, but we are excited that this is going to be a workshop series. So even if you miss this, you can watch the recording and attend the next session as is. So this series will contain um, two sessions. One is today's session, which is explored EIB 2771 and Biconomy, very sh short introduction to Biconomy. And the next session, we'll go deep dive into Biconomy and also look at some code and how it works and uh, how Biconomy basically helps uh, make developers and users' lives easier. Today's session is presented by the Phoenix Guild in association with Biconomy and MetaPass. Uh, so we put up our uh, tickets on MetaPass and you know, you would have, if you were able to claim your NFT tickets, then that also acts as a kind of co-op for you to have attended this session. We'll do some funky things with, the, with these kind of tickets eventually. Uh, we'll think of something where members who have attended more sessions will have some perks, etc. So that's the idea. Now, uh, today's session basically uh, is set up in like a very short, like 40 minute, 30 to 40 minutes kind of format. Um, we'll talk about what are EIPs and uh, what specifically EIP 2771 and the problem that is solving. And we'll do a short introduction to Biconomy. Uh, for those of you who are new to the Phoenix Guild, I'm going to do this very quickly. Phoenix Guild is a community to help educate and uh, empower minorities in Web3. Uh, we are primarily focusing on women and non-binary folks, but uh, all our educational sessions are open to everyone. And we are super excited to have a lot of male allies with us who support us in this vision and also want to contribute uh, to the diverse, diverse ecosystem. Uh, Phoenix Guild was started by four uh, Phoenixes, Krati, myself, Sri Lakshmi and Nivedita, and we started with the help of an Ocean Dow grant. Uh, but as you have seen, we have grown, we are collaborating with various different protocols. We are blockchain protocol agnostic, uh, and we want to basically ensure that our community is able to learn and grow uh, in the Web3 space. So the problem that we are going to be primarily talking about today is when we say like we want to onboard the next million users, the next billion users, how are we going to do that, right? Because every user who wants to have a footprint on blockchain, right, the network itself, uh, the first thing they need to do is create a wallet, right? Or have an account for themselves. Now they need to fund the wallet, obviously, in order to interact with the ecosystem. So if you want to send money to someone, you need to have some funding in your wallet. If you need to interact with some decentralized applications, you need to have some funding in your wallet, uh, right? So basically having some funds in your wallet is essential. Whether you get those funds by buying some cryptocurrencies or whether you get them by winning some hackathons, some bounties or whatever be it, right? It's essential to fund your wallet. Now, the third step, obviously, is that you should want to spend some funds to interact with dApps. For example, um, we put up the ticket on Metabus, right? What if we had made the ticket as gated? We had about 19 tickets that were sold out of 100. Uh, but what if those tickets had some price associated with it, right? It would have, you would have had to do the second step that is fund your wallet in order to buy the ticket. And would there be next billion people who would actually be buying the ticket if it was gated with some sort of amount, right? The same goes with other examples like UPI, Paytm, or any other apps that we use uh, commonly in India or elsewhere abroad. Right, uh, Venmo, for example, or uh, uh, other other applications in the Web two world, uh, where you would need to pay. Right, um, you would definitely think twice about doing that because the next billion users are not all going to be uh, upper class rich people who can actually afford to buy crypto. Right, but still, we want them to have the experience to be able to interact with Web three applications. We want them to be able to interact with these applications to understand how they work we want them to bring we want to bring them onto the web3 world the primary challenge that uh, we folk we face is being able to fund the wallet right the second step 
funding a wallet at this point is a multi step process and probably for a long time it's going to be like this unless and until there are innovations in the wallet uh, side of things there are lots of innovations happening but we are yet to see anything concrete being rolled out so if you see the steps of funding a wallet it is a multi step process right that is the first thing is you search as to what is the best centralized exchange where you can buy the funds into right um it could be binance as one of the logo sets here it could be uh, okx exchange it could be um i don't know you know coin or or basically any any type of centralized exchange uh, where you can create an account for yourself and you can buy the cryptocurrency using fiat right um the first thing uh, is of course that now the second thing is you need to deposit fiat into that particular centralized exchange right um if you want to for example uh, buy say coinbase right uh, coinbase actually allows you to directly buy you using upi but say you go some other route right um, you what you need to do is you need to have transfer money from your bank into this centralized exchange then you use that money to um buy some crypto right now again Uh, this entire thing is a multi step process in itself right how much money can you transfer it one one shot um from your bank to this wallet it depends from exchanges to exchanges right second thing what kind of currencies does it support uh, suppose right now i am in paris right uh, and i may just want to transfer some um euros but maybe the app that i am working with is an indian app and it does not support euros uh, maybe i receive my payment as a contractor in usd so maybe i want to transfer usd into my centralized exchange account to buy crypto but i'm i'm not able to do it because not many of the centralized exchanges support usd right and and then which bank do i use how do i transfer right there are so many questions and so many things to uncertainties to this particular process right once you have the funds fiat funds into your wallet account you will use those funds to buy the crypto right again um as a, a first time user what kind of crypto should you buy should you buy stable coins like usdc usdt or should you buy eth should you buy btc should you buy bnb or what what could you buy right from what you have in your exchange all of these are questions that not everybody understands clearly and if we want to build for the next billion users for the masses we need to make sure that some of these hassles can be solved of course the last step is once you have funds in your centralized exchange right if you want to interact with the decentralized applications most of them support decentralized exchanges or d or just wallets like metamask right so then you would want to uh, transfer your fund from your centralized exchange like binance or something to metamask right thereby sometimes maybe you may end up paying some gas fee and now you are ready to interact with your decentralized application right even though i have quoted binance as one of the examples the phoenix guild does not endorse any centralized exchange this is purely for educational purposes that i have this logo for you to understand better right uh now this process how can we simplify this process right can we find solutions for this huge and uh, you know uh, cumbersome process at least at some steps in order to simplify it and make it better this is where <clears throat> one of the possible solutions is gasless dapps right um have any of you heard of gasless dapps and according to you when you think about gasless dapps what comes to your mind no i haven't heard about it this is the first time i'm hearing so no idea okay so let's say i tell you the word gasless dapp that this dapp is gasless what would you like this dapp to do for you like when you when you connect your metamask wallet with a particular application and i say that it's a gasless dapp what would you like it to be what's your wish list
does anyone wanna anyone has any wish, wish list for gasless dabs okay so the idea of gasless dabs and it could be multiple types of gasless dabs right there is no one definition for gasless dabs but one of the common things is for cheaper chains like maybe layer two chains or something is there a way that the dap itself can pay the gas fees for the user thereby making it zero gas fees for the user right um, for example if you bought the ticket um, that is if you uh, claim the ticket from uh, metapass hq right uh, yeah, yes, Muflia, you're right. It's a kind of dApp that doesn't need gas for transactions. Exactly. So this is one type of solution. That is, the dApp itself at the background will pay the gas fee, so the user doesn't have to pay the gas fee. So when you interact with the dApp, it seems like this dApp does not need any gas, right? That is one way of doing this. Now, there might be another type of gas less but it's not gas less it's more like um choice of paying gas in various currencies right what if the dap is like in beta stage what if they have not raised any funds or anything i mean basically i mean they are expecting a million transactions a day but they don't really have enough funds to cover gas for everyone right um in that case what if the dap allows you to choose in which currency you want to pay gas because one of the other problems that we see is that in many of the ethereum obviously if you transact on ethereum you need to pay gas in eth right because that's the native currency and that's the case with many most of the layer ones right in fact all of the layer ones you need to pay gas in the in the native currency of that particular layer one but what if you get an option to pay gas in any other currency of your choice, like USDC or USDT, right? Because you have that currency and you are willing to pay gas, but you don't want to pay it in ETH because you don't have ETH, right? What if you have zero ETH, but you have 100 USDC, 150 USDC, right? And you are allowed to pay gas using any of these ERC20, right? This also makes your life easier. So these are the different ways that we can help onboard more people onto the Web3 ecosystem from a gasless sort of um, way, right? By using a gasless way. But how do you think this happens, right? What is the technical concept that will allow me to interact with the DAB by paying just zero as gas fee, right? So, and I mention this every time when I talk about gasless. Gasless does not mean that nobody will be paying for the transaction because someone has to pay for the transaction. The blockchain network is going to be doing the computation for you. So you will have to pay the network for the transaction that gets executed. But gasless simply means that the user need not pay for the transaction somebody else will pay for that transaction. And these kind of transactions are called meta transactions. This is a very interesting concept, uh, which has been sort of wrapped around in, the, in this Ethereum Improvement Proposal or EIP numbered 2771. So meta transactions or a meta transaction separates the signer or the user who's interacting with the DAP and the gas fee payer of the transaction. So think of this happening at two levels, right? A user interacts with the DAP, right? Um, but in before this, there is something called as a relayer. So let's go to that and see how this happens. In a meta transaction, there are three participants. One is a user, right? And your DAP, for example, is the contract. That is participant number three. In the middle, there is something called as a relayer. So the user will sign the transaction with their private key. And this transaction is signed transaction is sent to the relayer. 
This relayer verifies the transaction that is received from the user and write, wraps the signed transaction into an Ethereum transaction and executes this by and adds the transaction fee to this transaction and calls the contract. So the contract will actually receive the transaction that is created by the relayer. It unwraps the original signature from it and uses that to actually facilitate the final transaction. Uh, to understand this better, right? Let's take a quick look at, um, there are two things here, right? The first thing that's happening is the user signing a transaction. So for the signing transaction, there is an EIP called 712. And then there is a relayer concept that comes into picture for which there is an EIP called 2771. This is largely the concept of our sort of uh, session today, our study today. We are largely studying 2771, but we need to understand and take a quick look at 712 before we move to 2771. Now, here I'm just going to open up the Ethereum docs. Okay, so first I want to talk about 712. That is an EIP. What are EIPs? EIPs are Ethereum Improvement Proposal, which talk about various standards or various kind of rules that can help add features and improve the Ethereum ecosystem. So EIP 712 is Ethereum typed structured data hashing and signing, right? I will not go through this entire EIP because it's a slightly longer, you can see, right? It's a slightly longer sort of uh, document, but what we want to do is just look at this summary, okay? That is whenever you want to, how, why do you use signing? Why do you use signing in real life also? Why do you sign documents? So that the other person who's reading that document or referring to that document knows that it is you who has approved this particular you know, set of rules, who has agreed to this set particular rules, who has agreed to transfer X amount of money from A to B or whatever, right? So signing is required to identify somebody uh, uniquely and to take their approval on certain activities, transactions, let's say, right? Not even just blockchain transactions, just real life transactions, right? Now, when we sign something, right? In the real world, we have complex, meaningful messages that we want to sign, right? There is some complexity behind the messages that are associated with the signature. And this is where we come into this sort of, um, how do we sign a message by a user in the crypto world, right? That happens through hashing. So we hash structured data, that is, that I am signing this particular transaction. That is, I'm allowing this particular uh, transfer to happen from my wallet to another wallet, right? So as a user, I will be signing that. Now, associated with this transfer will be some data that describes what this transfer is, right? What is the amount that I'm transferring? To whom am I transferring? From whom is it getting transferred? In what currency am I transferring, right? This is all data associated with that transaction. And this, transaction or this data will be hashed, right? And sent as a signature. Now, uh, if you see when, um, why is this important is because we do a lot of off-chain message signing for using on-chain. See, whenever we do a transaction on-chain, we have to pay gas fees. But what if we sign some approval off-chain, right? And then just send that approval part to store on chain, right? Why to store the entire data structure or why to show the entire structured data? Uh, why to use the contract just for signing, right? Because you will have to end up paying a lot of gas fees. So we can use off chain message signing mechanisms. Like basically it's just hashing, right? You're hashing off chain and then creating something and sending it on chain. 
when you and you must be i'm sure if you have been in crypto for a while you must have seen a lot of pop ups like this which ask you to just sign a message right so you need to read this and be very like careful of how this is uh working because every account or every site that asks you to sign you need to be like 100% sure that this site is not a malicious site right because once you sign something like i said it's like giving some sort of approval right so even if you are not transferring right you might have signed to say that you can use my account to transfer something like that right so whenever you find this like this kind of notification from metamask which says sign just be sure like which what are you interacting with you know um make sure that you are connected to the correct correct website uh, you are connected to the correct url etc so once you sign this what happens is at the underline it sort of has this you know think of this format that there is hello bob is the message that is being sent from alice to bob so this is something which will be sort of signed uh by alice saying that yes i i am authorizing sending a message hello bob to bob right so at the underline you could do the whatever it could be the different types of signing but this whole how the signature will happen what is the hashing algorithm behind it what is the signature algorithm behind it uh, so there's a hashing algorithm and the signing algorithm what are all these algorithms and all of these details are given by this eip 712 so we don't have to go too deep into it but we just know that there is an eip that exists for uh, signing off chain messages to be sent on chain so that's the first thing that we will use in order to execute 2771 now coming to our main eip right that is our subject of discussion today that is 2771 how does this work right EIP two seven seven one is a secure protocol for native meta transactions. What are meta transactions? Meta transactions are types of transactions where the user and the signer of a particular transaction are uh, sorry, the signer and the payer for a particular transaction are can be separated. One person can just sign the transaction. and another person can pay for that particular transaction right gas fees now the simple summary that uh, for this eip 2771 is that it's a contract interface for receiving meta transaction through a trusted forwarder right so let's take a quick look at this uh, sort of economy diagram uh, which i like um yeah so if you see this right there is going to be a user before this right uh, so we have three components one is a user one is a relayer and one is a contract so there is going to be a user who is going to be signing the transaction once the user signs the transaction there is going to be a relayer that's going to take that transaction and relay it to your smart contract right so that's the structure of that is being described in this particular sort of eip so you have a contract interface for receiving meta transactions through a trusted forwarder so here how will you ensure that a contract is able to receive a message and also identify who is the actual signer of this message who is the actual sender because if you are familiar with say for example solidity smart contracts there is a global variable called message dot sender right but in this case if you are using a relayer or a trusted forwarder to send the transaction then the message dot sender becomes a trusted forwarder right so how does this smart contract realize who is the actual signer of this message this is where this eip 277 comes into picture right now in meta transactions what happens the transaction itself is authorized by the transaction signer right that is an externally owned account for example my account i hold some eth or whatever usdc or whatever right and then the transaction itself is relayed by an untrusted third party that pays for the gas like you know this is the 
uh, general thing. But obviously, we don't want the un the third party to be untrusted. And this is where this trusted forwarder comes into picture. The problem that I mentioned is that how will the contract realize who is the message dot sender, right? Because it will make it appear to come from the gas relay and not the actual transaction signer, right? So this protocol specifies how this will happen. So if you see the workflow, there is a transaction signer who signs and sends the request, which is off chain. There is a gas relay, which is associated with a trusted forwarder. It sends a send and verify request to this particular trusted forwarder. This trusted forwarder will verify whether it's a correct signature, right? For example, what is this verification doing? Uh, if you kind of think about it is like, if I say I want to spend, send 10 USDC to Bob, right? And I sign a message. Who will verify whether I actually have 10 USDC or not, right? And, and whether this 10 USDC belongs to me because I have signed a message, right? How do you look at agreements? When you sign an agreement that I want to sell this house, right? Here, take my signature. There has to be a verification that this house actually belongs to me, right? I can't just sign on, go and sign on somebody else's paper. So this trusted forwarder will verify this signature, right? And make sure that this signature actually belongs to me, that I'm the only one who is who can initiate this transaction, right? Once this is done, it will append this my address, right, to the transaction, and it will send it to the recipient contract. Once the recipient contracts receives the transaction, right, which has my address appended in it, right, it will take out my address from this appended transaction and it will use that as the message dot sender, right? So whatever conditions you will put in your Solidity smart contract for message dot sender, you can extract that message dot sender from this message, the transaction message that comes from the trusted forwarder. So here you see now there are four elements. One is a transaction signer who who is an entity that signs and sends the request to the gas relay. The gas relay receives a signed uh, request off chain from the transaction signer and pays the gas to turn it into a valid transaction that goes through the trusted forwarder. The trusted forwarder is a contract which is trusted by this recipient. That is this trusted forwarder is these are like common contracts that are already deployed on chain, which are already published that these are the trusted forwarders who can verify the signatures. So every time the trusted forwarder forwards a signature to the recipient contract, the recipient contract will check whether it's only a trusted forwarder from whom I can receive this particular message. And the last is the recipient. That is a contract that can securely accept meta transactions through a trusted forwarder. So this contract has to actually comply with this standard in order to receive meta transactions, right? So you can see that the trusted forwarder is responsible for calling the recipient contract and must append the address of the transaction signer at the end of the call data. So if you see like what we are doing is we are using some encoding and we are using the data plus we are adding the from address of the signer. This is how the recipient contract can extract the original message dot sender and then apply the conditions of your contract on that message dot sender. So the recipient contract has to perform three operations. One is it checks that the forwarder is trusted, right? Even though it is out of the scope of this proposal, it is implemented by Biconomy. And we'll quickly go to that in a bit. Uh, it will extract that it has the ability to extract the transaction signer address from the last 20 bytes, that is this from address, and use that as the original sender of the transaction. So you'll apply a lot of conditions, right? Like message.sender should have this NFT, they should have this balance, or they should have the CRC20. Whatever conditions you want to apply, you can apply on the message.sender. If the message.sender is not a trusted forwarder, right? That is, if the 
intermediary is not a trusted forwarder, then return the original message dot sender as it is. The recipient must check that it trusts the forwarder. So before we actually go to kind of, you know, uh, talk about biconomy a little bit, I want to quickly show you an example of how this will work, right? If you see a recipient example, here is a function called purchase item where we are extracting the address using a function called underscore message sender. We are not directly taking message dot sender. Why? Because in this case, message dot sender is a relayer contract. So in the constructor of this contract, we are setting as to who is the trusted forwarder. That is from which contract can we actually receive a transaction? See, if you see the EIP, the standard or the rule says that recipient must check who is a trusted forwarder, right? So that's why here in the beginning itself, we are establishing that this particular address is a trusted forwarder and you can receive transactions only from this address. And there is also a function called is trusted forwarder. So if you change the trusted forwarder, you can add a check to see if a particular contract is a trusted forwarder or not. And then there is a message sender, which basically extracts the signer from your transaction that is being sent. So you can see this is already happening. You don't have to do this because you will already have this in the form of underscore message dot message sender in your contract if you just implement EIP 2771, right? So this is like the main thing about how EIP 2771 works and how you can actually facilitate meta transactions in your particular contract. Now, the idea of Biconomy is basically, you know, their motto is to onboard the next billion users. And that's why I kind of use that as an example as to what can we do to onboard the next billion users. So Biconomy helps enable seamless transactions between your application and your end users. This is one of the biggest and frankly, one of the most hardest problems to crack because it's not very easy to onboard the next set of users. And if you see, there are so many applications that are coming up like left and right, but are people actually solving for those who require easy onboarding, right? So, uh, and Biconomy is definitely, in my opinion, trying to solve for that problem, right? By introducing things like meta transactions and trying to implement that in contracts. So if you see Biconomy, basically what they are doing is they are acting as uh, uh, add-ons. Uh, they are acting as um, a platform to that provides SDKs and APIs so that we can simply implement things like this EIP 2771, right? Users can directly implement it without actually having to go and read about EIP 2771 and go in detail and look at the technical uh, uh, things. You can directly instead just use the Biconomy SDK or APIs, right? The problems that they are solving are something we have already discussed in the beginning. Uh, every time, is there a necessity to pay gas fees, right? Uh, so why should your dApps charge you gas fees for every interaction that you do, right? And one of the other major bottlenecks is that in many dApps, of course, for example, deploy on Ethereum, you can only pay in ETH, right? Which the users may not even have. And in order to actually buy crypto, there is a long and complicated onboarding process, right? You need to buy fiat deposit and then, you know, sort of do that. Uh, Mayank, you have a question. You raise your hand. Uh, yeah. So I want uh, generally have a question, simple question. Like mm -hmm. if we are going to have not users not using the ETH for paying then, mm -hmm. so what kind of onboarding process do we are going to use? So there are two ways we can uh, build the onboarding process, right? One is that you can have, and it completely depends on you as an application builder and what you can afford to do. For example, if your dApp is deployed on Polygon, right? You as a dApp can actually pay the gas fee for the user because every time you will be paying something like 10 cents, right? You may pay 5 cents as gas fee. So you can actually deposit the money into the relayer 
and you can pay the gas fee for the user. So user will just have to sign and the gas fee will actually be paid by the relayer, right? So that can be one solution. Another solution can be that instead of users having to pay in ETH, users can pay in some other stable coin, which they are more likely to have. For example, USDC or USDT. How will this happen? This will happen in a way that users will pay USDC or USDT to the relayer, the gas relayer. The gas relayer will have ETH with them. So they will actually pay the ETH as the gas fees for the user on user's behalf. And user will, play, will pay some other ERC-20 that is supported by the platform. So these are two ways you can go for solving this problem. Based on which chain you are deployed on, you can use either of the solutions. So if you are using L2s, you can use like, you can pay, the DAP itself can pay the gas fee. But if you are directly using L1, maybe you can give the option to users to pay the gas fee in any other currency of their choice. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much. And one question is like, uh, how about the security of the particular layer that we are going to use it out? Because it is also critical and important. Mm -hmm. Sorry, what, what is the thing? How about? What about uh, the security of the relayer contracts that we are going to deploy it out? Yeah, that's why these relayer contracts, right? You have these trusted forwarders. So <coughs> you can't have like <coughs> just any relayer contract, right? You have to have these forwarders, which are already trusted and published, right? For example, um, I want to see, <coughs> let's see if there are any uh, trusted forwarders. Uh, contract addresses maybe yeah so you see there are already forwarder contracts that are deployed see you can see eip 2771 contracts trusted forwarders okay so forward is supported only on ethereum mainnet rinkabai and kovan you can still use eip 2771 uh, approach using bioeconomy forwarder right, to be set as trusted forwarder in your smart contracts on the below network. So you can see that there are already trusted forwarders that are published. So you will have to set in your smart contract that this is the only trusted forwarder that I want to use. So you have to be cautious when you're writing your contract as to who are you using as trusted forwarder. You can also write your own trusted forwarder from what I understand using EIP 2771. But that is why companies like Biconomy come into picture where they can provide you with a trusted forwarder. So you don't have to worry about the forwarder being, you know, having to write and deploy your own forwarder. So these contracts, because companies like Biconomy uh, would have already audited these contracts, right? And you can find the audit reports, you can find the contract code and everything fairly easily. That's why you, you kind of rely on these folks to uh, make sure that the trusted forwarder is the correct one. So you will have to do the work as an application developer to figure out what are the trusted forwarders that you would like to use. Similarly, you can see there are also DAP gas tank contracts that are published. That means like what are gas tank contracts? Like I told you, right? Like user can send something like USDC to the gas, to the, um, to the relayer and there'll be gas tanks. That means there'll be a gas tank, which will have a lot of ETH, right? So this tank will pay for the ETH. This tank will pay for the transaction. So there are contracts that also act as DAP gas tank contracts. So that can be used directly to deposit gap for every, uh, gas for every DAP. So you can use these trusted contracts. You can go through the code. You can uh, see what is the audit and you know where it stands. And then you can take a call which one you want to use. Sure. Thanks so much. So the idea, like basically the idea of Bioeconomy is to be able to enable gasless transactions, right? So the two approaches, that is one is we can use uh, either any um, ERC-20 to pay for gas or uh, the, the DAP itself pays for the gas by creating these gas tanks, right? So uh, you can see the first thing that they also use is the EIP 2771 approach, right? That is, they have a Bioeconomy relayer that uh, forwards 
the signature to the trusted forwarder. The trusted forwarder will check the signature and then call the smart contract. So this whole concept is the concept of meta transactions. But one thing that Biconomy is doing is they're implementing the concept of meta transactions and creating these trusted forwarder and layer contracts that will that are audited and make sure that uh, they are functioning in the right way possible without being able to drain the funds, right? Now, uh, the, the smart contract changes, we are already familiar. We need to make some smart contract changes like add a trusted forwarder and also make sure that the message dot sender, we are not using message dot sender, but also we are using a method called underscore message sender. So this, once you actually take this, right? Like open Zeppelin, uh, ERC 7221, or you, you know, um, take, uh, take this ERC 771, uh, 2771 context, you directly get the message dot sender into your uh, into your contract, right? So you can directly use that and it will unwrap and give you the original message dot sender or the signer. And then you have this set trusted forwarder method that you need to add, which will set the trusted forwarder that your contract will trust, right? And then you use underscore message sender, not message dot sender, right? Uh, because this message dot sender will be the relayer or the trusted forwarder. So when do you use this approach? Like I said, right? If you want to onboard the next set of users who don't want to pay gas fee for uh, contracts for interacting with dApps, uh, but and and or who don't want to pay gas fee in ETH on mainnet, you can uh, onboard those folks using uh, Biconomy SDKs and APIs. So the way to do this is actually fairly simple, right? So you can just make some changes in your uh, sort of contract. You can register the smart contracts that you are building. So you have this Biconomy Bicon dashboard uh, where you can have like the name of the smart contract, the address of the smart contract and the uh, trusted forwarder. So you just add your smart contract details onto the Biconomy uh, dashboard. Let me see if I can open the dashboard. Okay, yeah, I think I'll, um, I think I should just be able to open it. Ah, uh, yeah. So it's very, very simple. Like basically it's very user friendly. Uh, you can just register your artifacts. You can just, just follow this like tutorial. Once you deploy your co uh, contract, make sure that first before deploying, you uh, make sure that you are, uh, you know, you have added all the related changes in your smart contract, like trusted forwarder, you don't use message or sender, but use mm -hmm. underscore message sender and all of those things. Then you can, once you upload your smart contract, you can select the smart contract methods, which need to be called from the client side. And then you can basically, you know, uh, after adding these, you can uh, use the SDK integration or use the API integration to call it from your front end. So this is like pretty straightforward. Uh, if you are, a, I'm not a front end developer, so uh, I'm not going to be going through the front end integration. But if you are, I believe that if you have just used either Web3.js or Ethers.js, it should be fairly simple to just import the SDK and kind of, you know, generate your... Uh, uh, API key and be able to add your parameters and then you should be uh, good to go. So this is uh, fairly simple. Uh, there are uh, two things that you can work with. One is the SDK, one is the API, uh, whichever you prefer to use uh, and you can uh, work with that. And there are also certain other implementations that uh, Biconomy gives you. So one is uh, a custom implementation style that is if you don't want, like, uh, you know, um, you don't want to use these existing trusted forwarders and all that, you can basically write your own custom implementation for meta transactions, right? So there are some basic changes that will still happen as it is. But if you want some more additional changes in your uh, adding on to your EIP 2771, you can build your own custom uh, sort of. Uh, uh, gasless transactions as well, right? For example, one of the things that DAI token does is that whenever you do gasless transactions using DAI, 
there is a permit function that allows a user to give allowance to others right so this is a new feature that dai has kind of added right so you can uh, think of like what are the different things that you want associated with gasless transactions and you can just uh, write it in a custom way and you will still need a relayer infrastructure here for which you can use biconomy right now the third one and this is something that is still in progress right is that what if you use some external uh, you know um what if you use smart contract wallets right basically your wallets are not just accounts but they are smart contracts themselves right so in that case you will need to make some tweaks in your um, you know smart contract sort of okay so this is a situation where you have already deployed your contract okay and now you can't make those changes like message dot sender uh, you know changing that because you can't rewrite the contract right your contract already exists and you did not know about 2771 so you have deployed it now what would you do so this is where you can have a smart contract wallet approach where at the wallet level itself it enables the uh, gasless transactions right Uh, this is going to be very very useful for all the contracts that have already been deployed and users want to interact users still want to interact with these dapps in a gasless manner so this is where uh, the smart contract wallet approach comes into picture we are not going to go too deep into it because it's still um, under progress like there are lots of people who are building smart contract wallets and i personally believe that that's going to be something interesting seeing as how centralized wallets like celsius and all have um, you know kind of just completely gone out of the ecosystem i want to see how smart contract wallets work i, I don't have an i think argent etc are, are doing some good job uh, but i don't know anybody who's doing a gasless sort of thing right now so i'm rooting for some projects that can um come up and sort of do this for users right uh so this is just like a very introductory uh, thing about what biconomy does it also have a it also has a cross chain bridge called hyphen uh, this is a very interesting one where you can basically uh, get your funds from layer 2 to layer 1 and vice versa uh, so sometimes when you are transferring from layer 2 to layer 1 it take it could take you anything like if you use plasma chain and stuff it could take up to like 7 days Uh, whereas here it takes like you know uh, much lesser using uh, this thing called uh, uh, watchtower and executor we are not going to go too deep into it uh, there is a hyphen widget that you can play around with it's like fairly simple to integrate this suppose you have a cross chain dapp right and you want to make sure that people uh, can move from one layer to another and also transfer funds you can just quickly integrate this widget into your platform uh, there is like this 3 minute video that shows you how to integrate the widget so it's basically that quick if you're obviously if you're already good at printing so these are couple of things that biconomy offers uh, and it's a very interesting product uh, definitely sort of uh, i would say worth uh, exploring um, and uh, yeah you should uh, i'm sure there's like a lot to learn as you sort of explore and see um, how things work in in this space for our second session we will be having a uh, uh a more deep dive sort of uh, how does biconomy work and uh, you know deep dive into a little bit uh, taking a look at uh, code and uh, uh, how you can execute the code and just like couple of smart contracts and such and our uh, uh, second uh, session will happen on tuesday and uh, if you have registered for this session you can pretty much use the same zoom link uh because it's the same zoom zoom link for both the sessions and uh, we have a speaker from biconomy itself who's going to be uh, talking a little bit more about how things are working maybe some alpha on what they are going to release etc so um i'm excited for that and hoping that i get to see you all on tuesday as well uh, for our today's session it's basically just this much uh, one exciting thing that we have is uh, and this is an alpha that those of you who are attending the session today only are going to get first and then we'll make a twitter announcement later about this so if you are since you um, i i hope most of you were able to get your ticket from metapass uh, because we have collaborated with them for a bounty 
that is we are going to have and this is a one of a kind bounty uh, we are going to have two bounties of 250 dollars each and these are going to be event bounties that is you need to um, do an event for the phoenix guild and the ticket for that event should be up on metapass of course it uh, event will be free uh, because it should be open for all our community members and this bounty is actually on first come first serve basis so oh uh, hey joanne you uh, got the ticket from uh, uh, metapass but you did not get the zoom link yeah, so I, I I successfully got the ticket on the platform, but mm -hmm. I thought they would have sent the Zoom link. I never got it. That's why I was late. So I frantically went into the Telegram group and then I saw you put the link there. I was like, oh, okay. Maybe I missed it. I don't know. Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, okay, maybe this is a good feedback as well to give. So what okay. happens is when we like uh, buy our ticket, uh, the information associated with the ticket immediately comes during like you know the ticket purchase so basically when i bought the ticket it just mm. gave me that here is your like zoom link uh like you know while oh. so okay. just when you get that ticket pop up that's when i got the zoom link but this is a feedback that i should definitely give them like like you know uh that they should be able to put the zoom link in the reminder emails or something uh, okay, so you yeah. when you did it, you got a pop up. You're saying, you yeah, yeah, yeah. I oh. got a pop up, and I also like. I don't know. This is super weird, but I also get like when I click on this go to event. Like I don't know if you're able to see my screen. Like right now, yeah. if I click on this go to event, it actually takes me to the Zoom link. Oh, interesting. Uh, okay, yeah. I'll just pay more attention to that next time. But it's okay. I I eventually got it from the Telegram group. But I thank you. Yeah, no problem. I think I'll explore this as well a little bit more and maybe ask them to send some like guidelines and stuff. Uh, but yeah, basically the bounties, we are going to have two event bounties where um, you can as an individual do an event or you can do it with a group of people who you would like to, but obviously you have to split the bounty with them. And you can choose a topic. Uh, we prefer something uh, technical. It could even be like basics of anything in Web3, right? For example, how does this protocol work? How does that protocol work? Could be something very simple. It doesn't have to be coding related. It doesn't have to be deep tech. It can just be some introduction to something in Web3, right? And it, it should not be any topics that we have covered already uh, so that you can check out from our uh, YouTube playlist, what are the topics that have already been covered and the events will start in the month of August. So um, you can till then you can decide what is what are the topics that you would like to host an event on. And you need not be the speaker, you can also bring a speaker from the industry. Uh, so it's up to you, however you want to do the event. Right. And um, we will help you with the Zoom link and stuff. But you will have to create this event on Metabus. Uh, and you, you, we can help you with a poster and stuff. Like we'll give you the logos and such everything. Uh, and of course, you, you can, we'll help you with the publicity, marketing as well. Like uh, just putting it on social media. You can do it yourself. Uh, try to get as many people as just uh, possible. And once you complete the event, you or you and your team whoever set up the event will be uh, getting the bounty you can decide to like uh, keep the bounty for yourself maybe give part of it to the speaker it's up to you you can be the speakers yourself uh, everything is basically allowed just that you need to decide the topics and you need to put it on the telegram group the more people vote for your topic uh, the likely your event is uh, to be picked right there is no other criteria for us we are not biased one topic versus the other. If the community wants a topic, we are happy to uh, do that event. So that's an event bounty. Uh, there are two bounties. That means two events. Uh, and we want to do this in collaboration with Metapass. So if you, uh, you can start posting the topics, your ideas in the community. You can start looking for speakers and then also let us know what date and time you would like to have the event. And we'll give you the autonomy to do it end to end. So that's the bounty. Uh, bounty is 250 USD per event.
Uh, yes. Uh, so it has to be like uh, like this uh, session, like 40 to 45 minutes. Talking yeah. about any yeah, 40 minutes is ideal. Yeah, 40, 40, 40 plus minutes, 40 to 60 minutes. If you are doing a workshop, you can do up to one and a half hours, but like after that, people just lose kind of interest, you know, if it's online. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So I would not suggest anything more than 1.5 hours. Uh, you can do a coding workshop. You can do like a basics of like, uh, you know, uh, anything new in the tech space. You can choose any blockchain. We are blockchain agnostic. Uh, but yeah, it, it has to be in the Web3 space. And also you have to put up your topic on Telegram and make sure that people vote for it because really like uh, we want to do events uh, which will help people learn about things. And if you think there are topics that people will be more curious to learn about, you can pick one versus the other, right? Uh, based on what people are more interested in. So um, that's our bounty announcement. Uh, we will make this officially on Telegram as well. Uh, but since you all were able to attend today's session, you are the first lucky ones uh, to get to know about this. And you can start working on it ASAP, uh, right? You had the advantage because you attended the session. And, uh, but we'll, open, we'll be opening it up to the uh, wider community as well. Right now we have two bounties. Maybe if the events go well and if the MetaPass team likes the engagement, uh, you know, like that's why we want to sell as many tickets of this event. I mean, sell, I mean, you know, it's zero, right? But still, we want to see more people interact with the MetaPass team. So MetaPass tickets. So if you are able to publicize your event more, maybe they can give us, you know, funds for hosting more bounties in the future as well. So that's the idea. But yeah, uh, best of luck. And if there are any questions now, I'm just going to open the floor for them. Any questions on EIP 2771 or anything related to Biconomy? Uh, we are going to have another Biconomy session, which is going to be interesting. Please do attend that as well, because we are collaborating with Biconomy and we'll be releasing some Biconomy bounties as well. So uh, great that you attended this session. Uh, there's a very cool bounty coming up associated with today's session as well. And there'll be one associated with Tuesday session, which we will announce after the MetaPass bounties. Okay, if there are no questions, I will stop the session.